Hey, Cypher here. This is part 7 of a series I've been doing on California history. If you haven't seen the previous ones, it's not necessary to see those other ones, but context is always useful. This can be viewed in isolation if you prefer, though. California was in a near constant state of war with American Indians since the Bear Flag days. There had even been a couple of Indian massacres related to that war. But what really set things toward a violent streak was the gold rush. As thousands upon thousands of miners and settlers poured into the gold fields, local Indians were pushed out of the way. Those in the Sierra Nevadas were ill-equipped to defend themselves from this onslaught, so they often resorted to raiding for sustenance. This unfortunately resulted in numerous wars to stop the Indian raiding. This was the main reason for the creation of state militias and fighting forces in the newly organized state of California. These militias were codified in 1850 under two acts, an act concerning volunteer or independent companies, and an act concerning the organization of the militia. This was a recipe for disaster, because civilians were allowed to take up expeditions on their own, and streamline the process for militia-ordered expeditions against Indians. In 1850 alone, two expeditions against Indians were called by the governor, and it got worse over time. A year later, that same governor said, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. He wasn't wrong. Between 1850 and 1870, there were more wars against Indians than in the rest of the United States. That's quite a feat considering the worst time for Indian wars in U.S. history was part of that time. Waves of disease, malnutrition, and mistreatment do not account for the tremendous loss of life during this period. Direct violence was a significant factor. One tribe was so thoroughly wiped out that only one man of the Yana survived into the 20th century. It became especially horrendous in Round Valley where there were more massacres than it is possible to count. Far Northern California had seen numerous massacres since the Russians had set up a post there in the early 19th century, and those massacres had continued all the way to when American hunters came across Round Valley in 1854. They proceeded to shoot into the valley for what seemed like fun to them. For over a decade afterward, settlers would massacre local Indians in horrendous numbers, often in response to some minor offense like petty theft. Because of the Indian Code, a local militia was raised in 1859, and they continued to massacre Indians until the U.S. Cavalry came in to try stopping the so-called Mendocino War. Local justices were somewhat in on the massacres, and they did nothing to stop it, even approving payments to the militiamen who actively campaigned for complete extermination. Massacres and maltreatment continued well into the 1860s. It was so bad that some recent historians have started applying the United Nations definition of genocide to it, and accurately. Unlike things like the Trail of Tears, massacres like Wounded Knee, and lopsided wars such as the Paiute War, this is a real candidate for genocide. One historian called it democratically imposed genocide. Before that, even the Orthodox historian H. H. Bancroft termed it the extermination of the Indians. Before the California Indian Wars, Indians made up a large proportion of the Vaquero workforce that produced the main source of revenue for Alta California. By the end, Indians were difficult to find, but racialized labor remained a key part of the evolving economy of the mid to late 19th century but other races had to carry that burden. The pre-existing California population was already fairly well-to-do, but incoming Hispanics were readily employed as laborers. This led to several race riots, including the enormous one in 1856 Los Angeles, and brought the 1855 expansion of anti-vagrancy laws against them in an act known as the Greaser Act because it actually used that racist terminology. But because of California's influence, Hispanics were able to integrate better than other incoming minorities. All kinds of foreigners came to California during the gold rush, and in 1850, California imposed a tax on all of them. 
it didn't help stem the tide and was quite invasive of any aliens in the state. One particular minority was targeted time and again with more discriminatory laws and worse social inequality. Chinese people began immigrating in the earliest days of the gold rush, but many came seeking refuge because of the Taiping Rebellion. As a result, many held loyalty to the Qing or the Hong and would fight in gang conflicts, often egged on by Americans simply for the spectacle of it. Chinese immigrants were used as manual laborers, often working for cheaper prices and being segregated into ghettos everywhere they went. A cottage industry of powerful Chinese bosses, called padrones, controlled these laborers, often like gangs. Though the Chinese were integral to the building of numerous major works, such as the western half of the Transcontinental Railroad, Californians grew to resent them. People saw them as taking jobs away from Americans. There were increasingly discriminatory laws passed against them by California. It worsened throughout the years, and Chinese workers were targeted in racialized violence for decades. By the 1870s, Chinese must-go signs could be seen all over the state. In 1875, an act to restrict Chinese immigration passed Congress, sponsored by California House member Horace Page. The greatest blow came seven years later with the aptly named Chinese Exclusion Act, which did exactly what it says. It was reinforced in a number of ways over the years. By this time, California's boomtown days were coming to a close. Bodie would be the last gold rush in California, ending in the mid-1880s. While agriculture kept growing, as well as Hispanic labor alongside it, this was too steady to inspire a great deal of violence, though discriminatory laws did segregate many communities and anti-miscegenation laws attempted to maintain racial purity. Many municipalities had segregation laws, including their school systems. California led the country in desegregation in 1947 with the California Supreme Court ruling Mendez v. Westminster, which led to Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. Earl Warren was the California governor before becoming Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And California had the most comprehensive anti-miscegenation laws in the U.S., which began in 1850 and only got worse over time. Many states followed California's example. But here too, California was a leader in ending the laws. With the 1948 decision Perez v. Sharp, the Supreme Court didn't rule on it until Loving v. Virginia in 1967. While these are incredibly discriminatory laws, they did not lead to any significant racial conflict. In fact, they were designed specifically to stop racial conflict and reinforce white hegemony. Instead, the change that brought in new violence was a new kind of mining that would bring California into the 20th century. But that'll have to wait till the next episode, so be sure to like and subscribe to see more. I know these have been taking forever, but damn it, they take forever to make. So just stick with me, because the next one will come eventually.